Good morning. What a great joy for me and my wife to be able to be here. And thank you, Pastor Wendy, for the invite to be with Bucker Road Methodist. In fact, uh, I didn't say this yesterday, but she, I, I doubt she has heard me preach. Uh, so she's a woman of faith. Have you? <laughs> Have you heard me preach in the past before you invited me? I, I doubt so, or maybe once. So she is truly a woman of faith. So I want to thank her for the invite. Well, we had the joy of working with the Methodist Church uh, all these years, and I thank God for the partnership and the friendship that we can have. Amen? This morning, as our reader has read the text, so I'm not going to reread it, but there are certain things that I kind of want to highlight to us uh, as we prepare the context for that which I want to share with us. In fact, this is a very familiar portion of Scripture, and my guess is that many of you would have heard numerous sermons preach out from this text. My prayer this morning is that you will not allow a familiar text to give us the same old, same old kind of message. But let's ask for the Holy Spirit to illumine the information so that it becomes revelation to all of us this morning. So let's pray first. <clears throat> Father, we pray right now that by your blessed Holy Spirit who lives in all of us, whose job is to illumine minds and to bring us closer to Jesus, illumine the information that we have read, cause information to become revelation so that conviction will grow in our hearts so that we will see the full manifestation of God in our life. And so we bless this congregation here as well as those over the concert hall. Bless us in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. I want to share on a topic on breakthrough. I think breakthrough is very important because some of us need a relational breakthrough. Some of us need physical breakthrough. If your body's not well, we need a breakthrough. Others need a financial breakthrough. I'm not going to ask us how many of us need a financial breakthrough because my guesstimate is almost everybody needs a financial breakthrough. Then some of us need a spiritual breakthrough because uh, we're dealing with sin or some of us, whenever we open the Bibles, we read it, it kind of put us to a good sleep, yeah? So we all need breakthroughs of different kinds. And I believe breakthrough is very important. And if you understand this text, we all have read the Gospels, Matthew, Luke, Mark, and John, and many of us would have read different miracles done by Jesus Christ through Matthew, Luke, Mark, and John. But the interesting thing is for us to note that this miracle which we call the feeding of the 5,000, is actually a miracle that is recorded in the book of Matthew, Luke, Mark, and John. All four gospel writers recount the same story. And I believe that when all four gospel writers kind of write the same story, it must be a way that God is trying to speak to us so clearly. And sometimes God speaks a message, humanity doesn't hear it, so he hits it the second time, the third time, and the fourth time. Now it sounds like nagging, is it? Now how many of you as parents, both here and over at the other side, we have nagged at our children? Yeah, it's true. We as parents sometimes nag at our children. And the reason why we were nag at our kids is because it is something important that we want them to lay hold of. Isn't it true, parents? Yeah. And so if you are a child here and you're a kid sitting here, and I want you to know, your parents are trying to remind you of something very important. In the same way, when God repeats himself four times to four different gospel writers, it tells us of the significance and the importance of this text. All right, so this text begins with the fact that, as our reader read verse 13, Jesus heard, and then he withdrew to a solitary place. Now, the reason why uh, he withdrew to this desolate place uh, in the other translation, this, this is the NIV 1984, and I quote from the NIV 1984 all the time. And the reason why he withdrew to a solitary place is if you read the earlier text, it was because his cousin John the Baptist has just been beheaded. And so Jesus was kind of depressed, sad, and yes, I want you to know, Jesus goes through the same emotions as all of us, because when Jesus was on earth, he was 100% humanity besides 100% divinity. 
And so he went through the emotions and therefore he withdrew. But the crowd heard of him being in this place. So they all came and we all know the story that wherever Jesus was, there was always, there was always a huge crowd. And so now gives us a setting because there was a huge crowd. And Jesus had compassion. He began to minister to them. And Jesus ministered a long, long time. And just as uh, I was in Ghana last month with my wife, we flew in and, uh, and Kenya, they had me preach you know, every night for an hour, every, every, every night. And then we flew into Sri Lanka. It was an hour. And then flew into uh, London and then to Zurich. And I, we just came back from there. And I was preaching one and a half hours every night. And, uh, and so trust me, I could go an hour and a half, but uh, I think by the time if I do that, most of you would have left the hall. So we'll keep to time. All right. So, so what happened was that it was evening time because the scripture says as evening approached, the disciples came to Jesus and said, Master, this is a remote place. Uh, it's, it's already late. Send them to the villages that they may buy themselves something to eat. And the very reason why uh, the disciples made that statement, and many of us do not have the context of it, we have to look at John chapter 6. And in John chapter 6, verse 1 to 10, uh, verse 1 to verse 9, you will read of the context because Jesus saw the crowd, turns to the disciple and said to them, where are we going to buy Bread, where are we going to buy food for all of them? And that was really the push uh, of the crisis. And the disciples had a crisis. Just like you and I, the church, just as you and I, sometimes we have crisis moments in our life. And as a result of crisis, as a result of overwhelming circumstance that's happened in our life, we all need a breakthrough, isn't it? So the word breakthrough suggests that there is a cap. The word breakthrough suggests that there is a barrier over our life. The word breakthrough suggests that there is something that is holding us back from all that God has intended for us. And I want us to understand today, God has great things intended for every one of you. So would you help me by turning to the person beside you and tell them, God has great things intended for you. That's right. I see the parents telling this little girl, God has great things intended for you. And I'll say that to you too. You see, when you and I come into salvation, all right, when you and I give our life to Jesus Christ, invite Jesus into our lives, I want you to know, you did not just have eternal life. You don't just have eternal life because John chapter 10, verse 10, Jesus says, I've come that you might have life and life more abundantly. And that's talk about abundant life. And so while we are here on planet Earth, we experience eternal life life after death, so that there's eternity with Him. But while we're living on planet Earth, I want us to understand, God did not call us to strive. God calls us to thrive. And many of us, the church of Jesus Christ, are striving. And as a result of striving against the barriers in our life, we don't seem to break the barrier. And as a result of that, we are kept into this place. And we all need a breakthrough. So if you need a breakthrough, listen very carefully. But if you don't need a breakthrough, well, you could rest on me. I give you permission to sleep, all right? Fair enough. This morning, we're going to talk about breakthroughs and I want to share with you some keys to a breakthrough. So the first key to a breakthrough uh, is focused in verse 15. As evening approached, the disciples came to Jesus and said, Master, this is a remote place. Oh yeah, let me pause here. Let me put on pause. And over at the concert hall as well as here, I will need 12 men to help me finish my sermon. All right, so there are 12 of you God speaking to you right here in this room. There are 12 of you God speaking to over at the other side. So at the end of my sermon, when I call for the 12, those of you at the concert hall, please don't come here. Just go forward to the stage there and uh, there will be somebody that will address you, that will help me out. But there are 12 of you in this place I'm going to ask you to come in a moment's time. And when you come, you just have to line up right here, all right? Right in front of me. Okay? Got it? Good? Are we good to go? All right, so the first key here has to do with this word remote place. They turned to Jesus and said, Master, this is a remote place. You know, when, when a person like me reads the scripture, I find it incredulous in my mind that they will turn to Jesus and say, this is a remote place. And I reckon the reason why 
they came to Jesus and said, this is a remote place. It's because they were looking at the geographical boundaries. They were looking at the world around them. They were looking at the locale with their natural eyes. And when you see the world out from the natural mind, you can only experience natural laws. Are you hearing what I'm saying? When you perceive the world and the circumstance of the situation in your life out from the natural, you cannot have a miracle. You can only experience the realities of life. Now, as believers, you need to understand that we don't only live by the natural laws that God has given to us, which is what I call the realities of life, but God has also given us supernatural laws to tap into a miracle. And this is where the church has to learn to step out from the natural into the supernatural. So take for instance, natural law tells us about the law of gravity, isn't it? Law of gravity says that if I remove my hands from this himmel, what happens to this himmel? It will drop, right? It won't float because of the law of gravity. So just to prove that point, so you know, this, this drops. And we all need to live by the law of gravity, the natural laws. Because natural laws governs our life. Without natural laws, like the law of gravity, we will be floating. So we all need the natural law. But the problem with the natural laws are that there are some realities of these natural laws that will cause us to be impacted. Take, for instance, sicknesses. Sicknesses will impact us, right? Uh, financial difficulties will impact us, right? So there are different things that will impact us in the natural out of the natural laws, and we suffer the consequence of it. But as believers, we don't just live by natural laws, we have a supernatural law. Supernatural law is the law of God by which He breaks natural laws to give us a miracle. That's what it is. So a miracle is when God breaks out of the natural into the supernatural to give us a miracle. That's how you define it. So as long as you can only perceive the world in the natural, you cannot experience a miracle. So the only, the only way to experience a miracle is right now, stop looking at the world from your own worldview. You have to learn to see the world from God's worldview. I find it incredible that they say to Jesus, this is a remote place. Who is Jesus to us this morning? Who is Jesus? Jesus is the Son of God, yes? Jesus is also the miracle worker. And if Jesus is the miracle worker, if I was the disciples, I'll turn to him and say, Master, perfect, you are the answer here today because you are going to create the miracle. But no, they were not looking at Jesus because they could not perceive him as the Son of God. And as long as you and I cannot see Jesus in our life, you are not going to see a miracle. Like the song that we have sang a moment ago, I speak Jesus. And the reason why I speak Jesus is because I am cognizant. I am fully conscious of His presence. See, the key here, when you can perceive Jesus, you will be able to behold Jesus. When you cannot perceive Jesus, if you cannot see Jesus right now in your life, if you cannot see Jesus sitting right here with you, if you cannot see Jesus in the situation of your storm, then you will be like the disciples waking him up and say, Master, don't you, don't you care if we perish? I remember, I, you know, I've never grown up in, in Sunday school. I came to know Christ when I was, uh, old, old, uh, you know, in, as a young, young adult, so I never truly understood. But when I was a pastor, I used to oversee the children's ministry, the youth and the university folks. And I love to go to the children's church because we all sing this song, with Christ in the vessel we can smile at the storm. How many of you know the song? Yeah. With Christ in the vessel we can smile at the storm. But not the disciples. The disciples were perceiving the storm. They were not perceiving Christ. And if Christ is in your life and is sleeping, then everything's okay, isn't it? So the key here is to perceive Christ. Because when you can see Him, you can behold Him. When you can behold Him, that's where the miracles begins. Do you understand what I'm saying? Many years ago, after, six months after I received Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior, I went from 
75 kg, which is what I am now, to less than 45 kilogram. In three months, I dropped a lot of weight. Of course, uh, I told my wife, I, mean, I need to lose a couple more pound, uh, kilograms. Then I'll be perfect. And in that three months, I was passing out a lot of blood. And so I went to see the doctor and uh, finally they did the test and they came back to me real quick. You know, when the doctor calls you like the next day, you know you're in trouble. And they called me in and then they said to me, uh, you've got cancer. And then we have to operate on you right now. Uh, and now, at that age, uh, if you're a medical doctor here, it is impossible, almost nearly impossible for somebody who is a young adult to have colon cancer. Colon cancer belongs to the young and not the youngest. You know, because in my church, we don't have old people. We have young, younger, youngest. So youngest people don't, don't, don't get colon cancer. It is the other category. <coughs> You see, that's the reality of life, isn't it? That's the reality of life. I'm not asking us as believers to, to become an ostrich Christian to say, no, I don't believe. No, no, no. These are realities of life. And so I said to the doctor, uh, doctor, before the operation, uh, you know, before anything else, can I please go to church? He says, uh, and this is a non, non-believer. He says, uh, for what? I said, I need prayer. He says, no, we need to operate on you. I said, no, 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 no. I need prayer. I need to go to church. And so what I do was I left, church, I left the hospital. I just left the hospital, signed the indemnity form, and then I went, went to church. When I went to church, saw my pastor, and my pastor said, uh, hi, Dom. And then I said, uh, pastor, uh, I just want you to know I've just been diagnosed with cancer. And, uh, where do you come from? I said, the hospital. Then my pastor said, go back to the hospital. <laughs> Gave me a whole lectureship about doctors and medical science, which is, yes, God gives us doctor, God gives us medical science. I understand that. I understand the concept. But I said to her, I just want prayer. And so uh, she said the shortest prayer, Lord, touch Dominic and heal him in Jesus' name. Amen. Now go back to the hospital. (laughs) I said to her, thank you, but I disobeyed her. I decided to just go home. And yes, 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 moons after moons, uh, I'm still here today. I want you to know, I went for my medical test and there's not even a trace of cancer in my body. Yeah, give the Lord a hand. We are not talking about remission, friends. We're talking about eradication. You see, I can live by the facts of life and be, be, and be succumbed by the facts of life, be overwhelmed by the facts of life. But there's a truth of God. Don't you realize there's a difference between fact and the truth? The fact is, you may have cancer. What is the truth? The truth is that God is still our healer, Jehovah Rapha, the God who heals us. The fact is that your bank account may be low, but what's the truth? The truth is that He's the God who provides, Jehovah Jireh. The fact is, you are overwhelmed by problem after problem after problem. What's the truth? He is Jehovah Nisi, the God, our banner. The, tr- the fact is that there's a lot of turmoil going in your life. What is the truth? He is still the God of peace. Do you understand what I'm saying? So the, the, the key here, if, if we are going to live on this side of breakthrough, on this side of miracle, then one, I'm not saying, look, deny the facts. I'm saying, look at the facts. But you now need to operate in the truth. That's why Jesus says, I'm the way, the truth, and the life. That's the way of Christ. And the way of Christ is for us to live by the truth of of Christ. And we will live by the truth of Christ, then we can have the results of it. Do you understand what I'm saying? This is very important. The second point here. The disciples came to Jesus and said, this is a remote place, and it's already getting late. How many of you cook? Let me see your hand. How many of you cook? All right, I, I'm glad a few gentlemen raised hands. I cook. During circuit breaker, my son came up to my wife and me and said, Dad, Mom, if the, if the helper is cooking, I'm not eating. So daddies have to cook. So yeah, I, so I, I created a menu, breakfast, lunch, dinner for that two months. And I went grocery shopping every day. But I learned one thing. 
It takes a lot of time to cook. And then I learned the other thing. We can finish the food in 30 minutes. That's the irony of it. Having prepared so long, then you finish in half an hour. That's why, uh, husband, when your wife cooks for you, eat slowly. <coughs> so the disciples understand that even, even if they have the resources, and even if they have a supermarket that can, where they can purchase all the produce, they didn't have time. Time was not on their side. And because time was not on their side, that's why they say, send them away. Send the people to the villages that they may buy themselves something to eat. Ah, this comes the second thing. The second key, to, so the first key is to perceive Christ, to be cognizant of his presence so that you can have a miracle. The second is to understand God is not late, God is not early, God's on time. All right, so turn to the person beside you and tell them God's on time. Yes, God, yeah. God is on time. The reason why God did not come early, and many of us always say, oh God, please, you know, can you say we come early? Right. How many of you have that prayer? God, why don't you just come early? I want you to know, if God came early and rescued you, you and I would sing the old Frank Sinatra song, I did it my way. Because before you hit a problem, God resolved it for you. You think that you did it. So God loves you. God doesn't want you to steal His glory. So God waits for us to come to a place of surrender. That, that, so that when God turns up, you know, and you know, you know it's God. Isn't it true? Yeah. Do you know that lifeguard training teaches us not to plunge into the sea to save somebody? Many of us love to do a number, you know, of just jumping in to try and rescue. But do you know that the person who is being rescued does not understand the concept of being rescued when they are drowning? All they want is to get above water and to breathe. So if you jump in early while they're still struggling, they may impede the rescue operation. Think about it. So God is never late. But He's never early because He knows we're going to steal His glory. So lifeguard training actually teaches you to wait for a while, let a person drink enough water, stop struggling, you jump in and you save them. Yeah. So God is the same way. He doesn't come early. So at this point in time, we have to understand the concept of time. That when it's late, it is time for a miracle, isn't it? When it's late, it's time for a miracle. So if you are right now experiencing a lateness of the hour where you need rescue, that's right. This is a time to hand over. This is a time to take your hand off the steering wheel of the situation of your life and hand over. Then God will rescue you. You see, there is two concepts of time. The first concept of time is what we all call the chronos time, which is the word out of this word chronos. That's where English has the word chronology. The word chronos is actually a Greek word. All right, that's where we have the word chronology. Chronology tells us right now it's 9, uh, 9 17, uh, 11, 17, and I have to finish very soon. Uh, uh, and so it's a sequence of time. Chronology has to do with what you're going to do after this. In fact, after this, some of you are going to yamta. All right? So, so, so there is a sequence of events that follows one another. That's where we have this chronology. But there is a concept of time that many of us in church, we talk about, we have heard it, but we truly don't understand. And that word is kairos. Kairos time has to do with God's time. Kairos time has to do with the opportunity of God in our life. Kairos time has to do with when God opens the window of time, that is the moment we need to seize the moment to receive the blessing, to receive a breakthrough. And in every one of our life, there are moments, there are pockets of time where God comes and intervenes and opens a window. But sadly, sadly speaking, many times the church does not even recognize it. We just move on just continue to wallow in the situations of life. We don't realize that there is that opportunity right at the moment. It's very important for us that are struggling with an issue right now to stop and say, God, I believe today, I believe now is the Kairos moment. And then you hand over, God begins to do the rest. I remember uh, my wife and I have been uh, married right now for... Um, 
36 years. Yeah, all right. See, I got a... Whew. Very stressful. She's sitting here. So 30, 37, 38 years ago, 37, 38 years ago, I, I asked her to be my wife. Uh, and uh, at that point in time, I was in Bible school. And uh, you know, like what Pastor Wendy, you know, when we are in Bible school, somehow we're always poor. I, I think maybe they want to teach us how to intercede and how to pray. So as a Bible school student, you see, before I went to Bible school, I was in the Singapore Air Force and, and I was paid pretty well. I kind of have a, have a lifestyle. And then answering God's call was quite a miserable thing because I became extremely poor. And then on top of that, and then I was so poor. Then you're dating, then how to get married? But then this, this beautiful girl agreed to marry me. She's a woman of faith. And the reason why I said that was because when she saw my bank account, she almost backslide. <laughs> yeah, I had less than $10 in my bank account. But when I saw her bank account, I was very happy. <laughs> I was marrying upwards, you know. But I told her, you know, as a woman of God, let your yes be yes and your no be no, right? Now? Amen. And so, um, so we made preparations. This was in January. And so we made preparation for the end of the year, December to get married, December the 5th. And uh, as we were preparing, uh, she said, uh, how are you going to pay for this whole thing? And I told her, God will provide. Yeah. But at that point in time, I left Trinity to pioneer a church at Dynasty Hotel. Uh, there's no more Dynasty Hotel. You know, it's, I think, what is it? Uh, Marriott or whatever it's called. And so, so seven, seven Bible school students came out and we were pioneering this church. And uh, the church grew very rapidly. In fact, the church grew. It was seven of us. Uh, the church grew 30, 350 in our English congregation within that year and then 250 in our Chinese congregation. So it was growing rapidly. Uh, but at a point in time, uh, because I, I kind of bankrupt the seven Bible school students to start this church, I didn't put in a, I, I didn't put in a cent. I told them I'm going to use my gift of the gap. You guys put in all your cash. And that's how we started uh, the st startup, so to speak. It was doing well. Uh, and, uh, and then... And, and so, she asked me, uh, how are you going to pay? I said, well, God will provide. So, this was in January, by March, by June, you know, uh, there were more bills to pay. So, it came to a point where I said to her, you know, dear, why don't you lend me money? How many of you know, when you start lending money, uh, it's not going to be a good marriage, right? Uh, marriage counseling tells you, uh, deal with your finance, settle the financial issues first. By September, I was quite stressed up already. By September, see, it's like as evening approach. The night is coming. And then, you know, we came up with our guest list. Her guest list is only 50 people. My guest list is 1,500 people. You know, she said, where do you find this 1,500? I said, everybody in church. She said, you know everybody? I said, I don't know. You know, I just want them to celebrate with us. Enemies as well. She said, why? I said, let them know I'm getting married. They are not. You know, so... <laughs> So by September, I was quite stressed up. So she said, how are you going to pay? So I said to her, modern marriage, woman pays the bill. Right? How many men say amen? <laughs> Nobody. <laughs> you know, so October, I took, that, I took that pioneer church out to a camp in Malaysia. And while we were at this camp in Malaysia, a lady came up to me and she wanted me to counsel her and I said no. I just said to her, no. Uh, and, and part of the reason was, I don't do counselling. I hate counselling. In all my 18 years as senior pastor, I only counsel maybe a handful. Yeah. Because I don't like counselling. The problem in counselling is, you come to me with a problem, I give you the answer. You say, oh, amen, good. You leave. Next week, you come back with the same problem. And I say, well, don't waste my time. So I don't like counselling. And then number two, I don't like counselling ladies. I have the anointing that make them cry. And then every time I counsel them, they cry. And then they cry, give them a tissue, it's not enough. So you lend them your shoulder. But you know, they dirty your, your, your clothes. You know, all the crying. So I don't like counseling ladies. Sorry, ah. Huh? So she came up to me. I said, no, no, no time. Actually, I lied. La. It was not no time. La. And then so throughout the whole camp, every time I see her walk this way, I'm very busy. <laughs> so last day of the camp, we strike set. I'm sitting down. She came right beside me. Oh, you are free. So I knew I was nailed, no more chance to run. So I said, yes. Then like all ladies, I'm sorry, I'm not, not, 
not stereotyping, but she said to me, I don't know where to start. And then I'm like, start anywhere, start anywhere. And then she said, God said, hey, yo, if God says it, no need to counsel already. Do you understand? Huh? Now, so if you see your pastors for counseling, don't say God said. Uh, if you say God said, then everything is good. Then she said, God, God spoke to me. I, I said, okay, 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 what else? You know, then she said, um, uh, don't think I'm belittling you. How many of you know? Counseling just went south, right down, down south. Because it's about me. Then I'm like, okay, tell me what is it. Then she said, okay, wait. She opens her bag and zip her bag, handed me an envelope. She says, open the envelope, then you understand. <coughs> I open the envelope. It's a check. I saw there in the right box, a five figure. I look across my name. So I said, what is this? She said, in January, God says, sell all your SIA shares, sell off all the stock option and give the money to you. I said, immediately, I got so excited. What else did God say? So I learned one thing you know, about the concept of time. There's a Kairos moment in God. I also learned the other thing. God's not late. God's not early. God's on time. And because of this, I know it is God. It is always God. How many of you understand what I'm saying? Amen. All right, now time for me to have my 12 gentlemen. All right, so can I have 12 men to come right now stand in front of me? Come on, guys, quickly. Can I have 12 volunteers, 12 men? Over at the other side, please, 12 men, go to the front as well. Can I have 12 men? 12 men. You mean Bucker Road Methodists have no men? <laughs> come on, guys. Come, 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 come. Come, can I have you, sir? Can I borrow you? Come on, let's give a big hand. All right, thank you, thank you for coming. Quickly come, man. Last man will be Judas Iscariot. <laughs> All right. All right. One, two, three, four, five, six. I need six more, man. I need half a dozen. All right, quick, quickly come, quickly come. Quickly come. Over the other side, please, please respond. Please respond. All right, we need 12. Just 12, that's all. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten. Two more, two more. Lucky doer. Can I have two? All right, let's give a big hand. <coughs> I'm going to give you the last key to a breakthrough. The first key to a breakthrough has to do with how we perceive Jesus in the scenarios of our life so that we can live in truth. And when you live in truth, you have a breakthrough. The second has to do with understand the concept of time that God has a window of opportunity that He will open in our life and that God is not late, He's not early, He's on time. And this has to do with the third key. Twelve disciples a young boy gave up his lunchbox in, in the Gospel of John chapter 6. Five loaves, two fish. The disciples came to Jesus and said, we have here only five loaves, two fish. Now remember, in verse 15, they said this is a remote place, send them to the villages and all that, right? But look at verse 16. Verse 16, Jesus says, you give them something to eat. You give them something. Which is very important. This is the most important verse in this whole episode. This verse is the key verse of this story. It is always you give them something to eat. So here we have 12 disciples, five loaves of bread, two fish. The Bible says, verse 18, Jesus says, bring them here to me. Verse 19, Jesus had the people sit down, taking up the five loaves and two fish, he gave thanks. All right, please follow the scripture. Follow it very carefully, yeah? Then it says, he broke the loaf and he gave it to the disciples and the disciples gave it to the people. So here, first loaf, he breaks it into half. Give half of bread number one, barley loaf, to disciple number one. Gave the second half to disciple number two. Took bread number two, gave thanks, broke it, gave it to disciple number three and four. Took bread number three, gave thanks, broke it, gave it to disciple number five and six. Took bread number four, gave thanks, broke it, gave it to disciple number seven and eight. How many loaves of bread left? One. Took the last loaf of bread, broke it, gave it to disciple number nine and ten. What is left with Jesus? Two fish. How many disciples did not have something in their hands? Two. Is this coincidental? Huh? Kind of strange, isn't it? 
I don't think so. So let's follow. He blessed the fish. He didn't break it. It's not a fish jerky, all right? He, the Bible only said he broke the bread. Gave the fish to disciple number 11. Last item, disciple number 12. And I could almost vividly hear Jesus say, I know this is a remote place. Those people who are ever in need, people who are in need are always in a remote place. Don't you realize that? Whenever you're in need, all your friends disappear. Yeah, whenever you're in trouble, you realize you're in trouble alone. It's a remote place. Just like when I went in for my operation not too long ago, yeah, I may be surrounded by the nurses who was pushing me into the OT. But do you know, you feel very alone. It's always like a solitary place, a desolate place, a remote place. But I want you to know today, God loves to visit the remote places of our lives. It's always late. And I could hear Jesus says, yes, this is a remote place. Yes, it's late. But you who have something in your hand, you give them something to eat. And this is the third point. The third point here has to do with you have to give what you have. If you need a miracle, you've got to give what you have. If you need financial breakthrough, that's the reason why you give your tithe and your offering. Give and it shall be given unto you. Press down, shaken, running over. If you want time, then you give time to the Lord. You invest time in the Lord and God will return time back to you. If you want relationship, invest in relationship. And out of that comes the fruitfulness. That's the law of sowing and reaping. But it has to do with you giving what you have. That's why Jesus said to the church, you give them something to eat. It is always the church that needs to give something so that a breakthrough can happen in the world around them. And with that, let's thank you. Let's thank the 12 men as they go back to their seats. <clears throat> now watch this very carefully as I close. They went back to their seats. They went back to where the people were with half a loaf of barley bread. Half a loaf of barley bread. How to break bread? You see, in a lot of your mind, and I'm not prophetic, la, I'm just normal human being, because we've heard countless of sermons. We think Jesus break bread, more bread. He break bread, more bread. Hello, Jesus is not a bread-making machine. La. You can buy a bread-making machine, all right? Just go to Giant or, or NTUC or, or Carrefour. But the bread... The multiplication happens in the hand of the disciples. Why? Because in order to give what you have, you have to step out in faith. Because a lot of times we are uh, not enough. We look at our wallet, not enough. We look at our time, not enough. We look at ourselves, pitiful poverty, not enough. Isn't it true? But you have to step out in faith. And when you step out in faith to give what you have, a miracle always happened. Because God's agency of breakthrough is the church. God's agency of breakthrough for your family salvation is not your pastoral stuff. It's you. Because God placed you in the center of the people in your life, whether it's family, colleagues, or friends. You can reach them. The miracle of breakthrough in salvation is you for them. The miracle of healing signs and wonders in the people's life around you is you. Yeah, but you say, yeah, but you know, I have a need. Yeah, Jesus had a need too, right, isn't it? His cousin just passed away. Huge crowd. The disciples had a need, crisis. But do you realize 12 basket full? It was to remind the disciples, each and every one of them. When you step out to become God's agency or breakthrough to others, God will bless you. So, this morning as I, this afternoon as I close, or rather this morning as I close, stop trying to solve the problems of your own life. Hand it over to, hand it over to the Lord. Hand it over to the Lord. Perceive Him in your life. Stop trying to resolve it with your own timing. God's timing is the right time. And then, stop trying to hoard and you know, and, and keep everything for yourself because a lot of us we need, we need relationships 
Invest into relationships. Give your time to the Lord. I, I believe right now, in a moment's time, I'm going to I'm going to pray for two groups of people. I want to pray for a group that is having severe needs where you need a breakthrough. I'm going to pray for you to receive a breakthrough right here as well as in the other hall. But there's a second group of people. There's a second group of people and I want to take an offering of lives. In a sense that if you have talent, I want to challenge you to give that talent to the Lord. Because when you give that talent to the Lord, God will reap. Go and multiply the talent in your life, a whole basket full. I want to challenge you to give your finance to the Lord because when you sow to the Lord, God will... be given back unto you. Do you understand what I'm saying? If you need relationships, invest in a relationship by serving in this church. Invest by being a small group leader. Hey, this is a Methodist tradition. A small group is a Methodist tradition. It is not a concept from Cho Yonggi that everybody followed. Yeah. Invest into relationships around you. And you know what? In return, they will bless you. So don't, don't live in social bankruptcy or relational bankruptcy. Be blessed with it as you give what you have. Amen? So let's pray. Father, thank you for this that are here. And with every eye closed and every head bowed, both here in the sanctuary as well as in the concert hall, if you're here today and you need a breakthrough, you're going through a trying time, a difficult time, you need a relational breakthrough, <coughs> you need a financial breakthrough, some of you need a medical breakthrough. If you need a breakthrough of all kinds, I'm going to ask you to stand right now in the presence of God. Nobody looking. Just stand. That's right. If you need a breakthrough, just stand. Stand. That's right. Stand. That's right. Stand. Thank you for standing. That's right. Many are standing. Thank you for standing in the concert hall as well. Just keep standing. Just keep standing. You're standing before the Lord. You're standing in, in, in humility before the Lord today. Not in pride. If you know you need, a, if you, know you, need you have a need, you stand. All right? Don't let pride hold you don't let embarrassment and shyness, that's, that's the lie from the devil. You stand because you need that breakthrough. Just stand. Who else? Just keep standing. Many are standing. Many are standing in this century. I believe many are standing in a concert hall right now. You stand because I want to pray for you right now. I want to pray for this group of people. Just keep standing. Keep standing. I sense in my heart there is a, there's a few more of you that needs to stand. That's right. That's right. You need, you, you need a breakthrough. You need a breakthrough. Just stand. If there's a lot of chaos right now, just then, peace is going to come. Father, thank you for this that are standing. Lord, we stand in humbleness before you. In our humility, we come before you acknowledging that in our ability, we are not able to ride through the storm. But in you, we are able to. And so, Father, this who are standing right here and in the, in the concert hall, I pray right now for the Holy Spirit to come upon them and to enable them, cause them right now to see Jesus in the situations of their life. And as a result of them seeing Jesus, let the peace of Christ reign supreme in their hearts. I thank you, Father, just as you have brought healing and breakthroughs in my life, you're going to do the same for each and every one of these. And I want to thank you for testimonies of breakthroughs after breakthroughs after breakthroughs that are happening in their life. So thank you, Father. Thank you, Lord, for touching them and giving them breakthrough as they seize the opportunity right now in Jesus' name. I'm going to ask everybody to stand right now. Everybody, everybody, because we are the church. We are the 12 disciples. We are the church. It's not about, it's not about us sending people away, but it's about us giving what we have to become the agency of transformation. Father, as we stand to our feet today, we stand on the offering plate of the Holy Spirit, offering our life once again to be used by you. Father, if we have talent, use our talent. If we have time, use our time. If we have finances, use our finances. If we have intellectual ability, 
Help us to use those ability to further the kingdom of God. And so, Father, bless Bucker Road Methodist Church right now. And I thank you in Jesus' name. Amen.